this week's episode of the Compass Equip podcast. I'm your host with your co-host, Pastor Evan, and I'm Pastor Hayden. Hi. At Compass Bible Church, we exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ by reaching people for Christ, teaching people to be like Christ, and training people to serve Christ. And everything we do here at Compass, including this podcast, is to fulfill the mission of reaching, teaching, and training. Well, we didn't have a continuation of our series from a couple of weeks ago in the book of Matthew, but what we did have a was continuation a continuation of salvation from the Pentecost. That's right. We jumped into the book of Luke to talk about being lost and found from Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. Pastor Evan, would you read that text for us? Yeah, I need to make it up for that 11 a.m. service. I don't I think do anyone even noticed that you weren't doing it. Well, I did. And now, and you're, now, now te- you do. Now you're telling on yourself. It's okay. I'm transparent. <laughs> there we go. Luke 15, beginning in verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Oh, Pastor Hayden, you only had about 15 minutes or less to preach through a text. So what was the main point? Yeah, the main point is that if we are going to be Jesus-minded people, as gospel-centered people, that is just godly people, right? We must undertake the hard work of going after lost souls and genuinely celebrating when God saves them, even just one, right? There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Well, I actually have a couple worldview questions that are not on our little outline. So okay. you ready for them? I'm ready. Well, first, first and foremost, you know, how does the biblical review worldview compare to the idea about, you know, the biblical worldview says God cares about his lost stuff. Right. He doesn't think they're expendable. Ezekiel makes it clear. God, re- you know, does not rejoice at the death of the wicked. He will exact their justice. He would rather have them right. turn to repent. In Second Peter three nine, same concept. God is patient, wanting all people to repent. And so, how does the biblical worldview differ versus an unbiblical view of saying, you know, the wor- the correct worldview? God cares about his lost stuff. You know, how does it compare to the other worldviews? Oh, yeah. I mean, man, I mean, there's so much, right? Naturalism, existentialism, which is, you know... Isms. Isms. A lot of the isms, right? I mean, uh, what is, what does the world think that the human is worth? And uh, from a naturalistic worldview, we're worth the makeup of our, our compounds, which, you know, I haven't done the research, but I remember one time it was like, if you take all of the elements of your body and sell it on the open market, you're worth a couple of bucks. You know, all the molecules, all the things in your body. And worth $3. Uh, thank yeah. You <laughs> and it's like, okay, from a naturalistic worldview, you're not worth much. And you got to be careful saying, hey, you know, as a Christian, to, to think that souls aren't worth, you know, and that's just the body. I, and I'm talking about the soul as well. That God values, uh, God values the humans that he made. And we are broken, shattered images. Uh, many, of, many of them are destined for eternal eternity, separated from God. But that was not God. That's never been God's desire. I mean, all the texts that we can think about that talk about God not desiring the death of the wicked, God not wishing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. I mean, those texts show us that God desires for the salvation of people. He values them. I mean, we see the Psalms where where David talks about how uh, he was wonderfully made, you know, and how God knew the number of hair on his head. He knew all the days of his life before there was even one. I mean, these show you how, in, in a biblical worldview, that An individual is valuable to God. And we uh, often, even if we say we believe that, live a complete opposite. I mean, some of us live uh, a practical, naturalistic worldview that, you know, whatever that person wants to do, however they want to do it, however they want to be, whoever they want to be, at the end of the day, uh, whatever they want to be is great, which is a naturalistic worldview. And, you know, ah, whatever God wants to do with them at the end of the day, that's God will do it. But it's like that's pretty much a naturalistic worldview because you know that the Scripture says that if how are they going to hear if no one preaches to them? That's a biblical worldview. People aren't going to respond to the gospel unless they hear the gospel. And so for us to say, I don't need to be a part of the, the proclamation of the gospel uh, because uh, in your worldview, that person doesn't need you to share the gospel. That's not a biblical worldview. It's like a naturalistic worldview. Like, oh, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That's literally the definition of naturalism. And for you, you're saying, no, i got a biblical worldview, which means people respond to the gospel because according to Scripture, according to Romans, right, they hear the gospel being preached. And for us, you're going to have a biblical worldview. You're going to say, hey, I love the law. I value people the way God values people. I desire that lost people get saved. Like God desires lost people to get saved. And I'm willing 
to get my hands dirty to do it. Well, and I think that biblical worldview of value will help you be able to celebrate properly. And uh, the other worldview question I, I kind of have is kind of more of a comment you made, at least in the 9 a.m., where you know someone kind of pointed out, didn't it cost the woman more money to celebrate than to actually yeah. find the coin? Yeah. You know, how does a biblical worldview you know, differ compared to a non-biblical worldview about that. Yeah, that uh, there is a cost associated with everything, isn't there? And uh, every worldview has an idea of what is the cost and what is it worth. Uh, and, you know, and, and I understand, okay, do, well, if your church is spending a million dollars per conversion, okay, well, that's just bad stewardship. And right? I'm thinking, like, am I saying that a, that a person isn't worth a million dollars? No, 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 I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is I think your church can probably figure out how to spend less money and reach more people, right? You see, there's a difference there. Uh, people are uh, priceless because they're made in the image of God. Uh, and to say that, oh, they're not worth my time or worth my money is a non-biblical worldview, because then you are ascribing value based on what? Not the Bible, because the Bible ascribes great value to the people, Uh now, on the other hand, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, whatever, you want to spend a million dollars on this thing to see one person saved. It's like, no, that's called bad stewardship. And so for us, it's saying, no, what, is, what does the Bible say is a good use of our time? We'll make disciples. Well, even us, we're doing this podcast. It's, you know, five o'clock on a Sunday evening. And so it's like, is this a good use of our time? Well, let's ask ourselves, is it a good use of our time? Well, is it making disciples? Is it teaching people how to make disciples? Well, yeah, is it training people? Well, yeah, this is a great use of our time. This doesn't cost much money at all. Uh, and so it's really about saying, hey, is what I'm doing valuable for the kingdom? Is it going to cost money? It is. Is it going to take time? Yes, it is. Uh, but I got to make sure I'm basing my decisions off of would, would, would this be what God would want versus is this going to be, is this what I desire? Because, you know, you and me, you, could, you, could, you like missions. I love missions, right? You talked about going overseas. It's like, okay, if it costs you $50,000 to go overseas— to scout out a, a, a scout out a, a place to do missions is that valuable? Yes, right. It, it is. It's very valuable. Now, if you come back with no actionable items, was it valuable? No, it was. You were just a bad steward. And so, there's a time where that is a very good idea to spend the money to do that. There could be times where it's not because you're not doing the work that God has called you to do, and then it becomes more about saying you're trying to make things about your desire to go on an adventure and not God's desire to see lost people saved. No. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll briefly cover your three points. Uh, point number one, increase your love for the lost. Point number two, get your hands dirty. And point number three, celebrate salvation. Point number one, um, I'd love to kind of hit on each point about the ter- the different applications that you weren't able to elaborate on. I think that'd be a good place for us to sit since you only had 15 minutes to teach and preach to us this morning. So point number one, increase your love for the lost. What were the three R's you wanted me to remember that pirates love so much? Yeah. Well, my pirate application was to refrain, remember, and recall. Right, we want to increase our love for the lost. We at least need to lay this foundation uh, and I've talked about it a little bit up to this point, but you need to refrain from seeing lost people as expendable. That's not a biblical worldview. God does not see lost people as expendable because he uh, spent his only son to redeem lost people. So there you go when it comes to evaluation that God has about souls of people. none of, They aren't expendable. And, and even like I said in, in my sermon, I think maybe more of the 9 than 11, but you know, God, does that mean everyone's going to heaven? No, God's not a, God's not a universalist. Right? Not everyone's going to heaven. People are going to hell. That's, but that's the reason why there's a cost associated uh, that God has to give perfect justice. But in his perfect love, he has made a way for justice to be poured out and love and mercy to be extended. And so he didn't see people as expendable. Uh, he saw people as worth saving. Now, that's, you need to think about it. You should need, like wrestle with it. Not everyone's going to heaven. We're not universalists. God desires to see lost people saved. At the end of the day, you've got to recognize a couple of things, that God is desiring people to be saved. God's not a universalist. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a limit to the atonement of Christ, right? And, and we can get into that. But there's a limit. Because why? Because it's not unlimited. Not everybody's going to heaven. But I don't believe that you and me are the ones who get to, to broker and decide who's going to heaven or not. We don't. That's not our job. Our job, as I've heard over and over again, is that we're in cells, God's in management, right? I mean, all we're doing is being, we're on the floor, 
and we're we're going and telling people the truth about the gospel. God's the one that's deciding who He's saving, and who He's not. And and I, I, I had an argument. I had a conversation even in college. It was like, and someone said, you know, God would be loving if even one person made it to heaven. I'm like, huh? And we talked about, and we were saying God would be just if no one went went to heaven. Think about that. He would be just why? Because no one deserves heaven. No one is righteous for heaven. But God would be loving if even one individual got in because he, he they they got in there simply because God loved him enough to let him in because he put the judgment on Christ and even one person was clothed in the righteousness of Christ, God would be completely loving. But yet we know that many more than that, multitudes are going to make it into heaven. And that's just a great idea. Worldview. We're talking about worldview. He loves the lost. Refrain from seeing people as expendable. Remember that such for some of you is the second R. You need to remember that you were the sexually immoral, the idolater, the adulterers, the homosexuals, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the revilers, the swindlers. Uh, and, and, and there were even more than that. I mean, there's whole lists in Scripture. Things like these. And things like these, right? Uh, and such were some of you, is what Paul says. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And you got to remember that you were that lost person. So that should help you increase your love for the lost because you were the lost. And then recall. Recall that Jesus died for you while you were a sinner. Like he didn't die for you after you got cleaned up. He died for you while you were still a sinner. He didn't affirm your sin, but he tells the truth and love that we see through Scripture. And it's the same thing that shines the light in our face and says, Ooh, I am a sinner. I need Christ. And he died for me while I was a sinner. And it's our job to go tell people the same. To tell them the truth and love. Say, Christ died for you while you were still a sinner. Turn from your sin. Place your trust in him. And we want to tell people that because we love them. And as our love increased, the desire to get our hands dirty increases yeah. as well. So in order to get our hands dirty, we get to search diligently. So what were the three you know, applications it gave us in point number two to yeah. get our hands dirty? I, I'd like, I have a little illustration I didn't even get to share. But Ooh, this, last, share. this last week, Kayla and I went and played disc golf. Disc golf is a blast. It's not Frisbee. If you say Frisbee, you'll make a lot of disc golf players mad. But we were going out and playing by the river, and there is a course downtown that we like to play at. And uh, it was starting to storm. You threw uh, your Frisbee in the river, didn't you? I didn't. Let me tell you, though. Uh, it was starting to lightning, and uh, we were at the seventh hole, which if you know about the seventh hole, uh, no, no, eighth hole, the seventh and eighth, they're both bad. It's the seventh hole. Kayla throws her disc, and... Uh, no, it was the eighth hole. There you go. She throws the disc, and it just hits the ground and starts rolling. And I just start running after it, and it start, it rolls off of this cliff right into the water. And I sit there, and I'm like, okay. Uh, it fell off a cliff <laughs> into the deep part of the river, and it's lightning outside. I mean, this is just all kinds of bad news for me. You know, it's like it's dirty. We ran a suit of armor at the time. No, I wish I should have been. Uh, and then, but I'm like, that disc is my wife's favorite disc. And I just birdied that disc like three throws before. So I'm like, this isn't, we love this disc. You're talking disc off real good I know, right now. yeah. And it was like, there's so many more words. Anyway, uh, I had 10 more of these in my bag. Like, I'm like, I, I got plenty of discs. I don't need that disc. Like, uh, it's fine, you know. Uh, but literally, I climbed down this cliff in a lightning storm. Uh, I jump into the water. I literally get into the water, and I am, like, chest deep in the water. And to bend down and get a disc when you're chest deep means you go all the way under. You're, you're baptized. <laughs> you're placed into the water. And so I get out. I'm soaking wet, trying to climb back up this cliff. It's lightning outside. Now I'm soaking wet. But I got the disc. And it's like, that. that's like a very great illustration of, like... Bad stewardship. Uh, what? I'm just kidding. No, of <laughs> getting your hands dirty for people. It's like, yeah... Is it going to be the safest thing in the world? Sometimes probably not. Is it going to be the most comfortable thing? Absolutely not. Uh, and it's going to be uncomfortable. And you're going to sit there, do I, should I do this? And you're like, yeah, you should do this because uh, people are valuable to God. And I'm willing to say, okay, I'm jumping in. I'm jumping in the deep end, and I'm going to see lost people saved. Oh, and you want your, your three applications in short? Uh, yeah, you, and you see it in the text. Light a lamp, sweep the area, seek and find. I mean, that's the text. You need to start with the right tools, the Bible. You want to talk about worldview. Your worldview says every, it, your worldview is everything you believe about what the world's here for and how we can know what reality is and what that means for you and me and the afterlife. Well, you know what tells us all those things? The Bible. The Bible. And so if we're going to help other people start understanding what 
God, who God is, what God says, and what God wants of us, we've got to use the only tool that gives us the truth about that, and that is the Word of God. So we're going to light a lamp. We're going to start with the right tools, and that's the Bible. That's the light that teaches us what God says. And then we're going to sweep the area. We want to pinpoint a location, right? The, the woman pinpointed an area. I'm going to search this area for the lost coin. In the same way, we should pinpoint a location, an area of influence, an area of great need, whether it's at home, as many of us have people at home who need to get saved, whether it's at work or school or whatever it is, we got we to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to sweep this area and be diligent. And that's what it says. Be diligent to seek and find. You need to start investing. God wants people saved, and he wants to use you to reach people for Christ. I said it in the 11 ICE, invite, connect, and engage. Right? You need to invite people to church, let them hear the gospel. You need to connect with them afterwards, talk with them about it, and then engage with them, whether that's over coffee or lunch or dinner, and say, hey, I, I, you heard the gospel this week. Would you like to respond to it? And, and start helping them answer questions about their life through a biblical worldview, and it should lead them to an understanding of the gospel and their need to respond to it. All right. Well, point number three was celebrate salvation, and mm. you. Uh, I don't know that you didn't get to. The I didn't S's. get to the S's. You no. have three S's for us to, yeah. in order to help us celebrate salvation. And some of you were baptized, and yeah. in life groups, you should have a party. You should. I, I did say that part. Uh, that yeah, you Go should. With the three S's. The three S's. Here are the three S's. You want to celebrate salvation, and it's so important for us to be celebrating the things that God celebrates. And here's the three S's that help you apply that. You need to share stories of salvation. That's why I love our baptism services because mm-hmm. it's God's built-in system for celebrating salvation. Go and be baptized. So everyone gets to see. Everyone in an eye shot and ear shot gets to say, "Oh, we're celebrating something. God did something. He saved somebody." And so baptisms do that, and you need to share stories of salvation. We, we put all these on YouTube. You should share these on YouTube, right? You should tell other people, hey, this is what I heard today at church. Salvation through baptism, not through baptism, but salvation and expressed symbolically through baptism, right? Uh, that we get to share the stories of salvation. And then uh, the second S is shape. You need to shape your community around evangelistic celebrations. I like that. Right? You have a community, and your community needs to be shaped, and it needs to be shaped around these evangelistic celebrations. Like any time you hear uh, stories of evangelism or stories of salvation, it really needs to take front and center in your life group and in your in, in, in anywhere you are involved in your church in your life group. That you need to say, hey, my community is all about these stories of salvation. We're all about celebrating the, what God's doing to bring people to Himself, and that's why I brought up in the sermon that there should be a party in every life group this week that had someone to get baptized. Like, sometimes we are so flippant and so passive about when people say, I got saved or I got baptized. We're like, oh, good, good on you, mate. It's like, what do you mean? Like, heaven celebrates. And we're over here saying, good job. It's like, no, 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 no. That is not shaping your community around evangelistic celebrations. I think heaven's a good example. They shape their community around evangelistic celebrations. Like, it's all about worshiping God who saves even right now, in, th- in this redemptive point in history, heaven celebrates when someone gets saved. And we're all going to be up there because we got saved up there. We're all going to be in heaven and then on the he- new heavens and the new earth because we got saved. It- it's all about salvation. We should be all about salvation. Share, shape, and show. The last one, show. You need to show others how God values salvation. It's like the way that you talk about salvation, the way that you care about people being saved, the way that you um, spend time helping people see their need to be saved, will show others how God values salvation. God values it so much that he sent his only son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And that shows how God values it. And what does your life look like that shows uh, how much you value it, that would reflect God's value of salvation? So share, shape, and show. All right. Well, Compass, we have some application questions to get done. So, Pastor Hayden, any guidance on these application questions? Yeah, apply them. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's t- we do that all the time. Yeah, I, all of these questions I think are just very applicable. Uh, they're they're very. They're very, I think they can be very simple. But I just hey, just because they're simple doesn't mean they're easy. Okay, like you need to say, oh, how am I? Gonna, or what am I going to do? Like get get your hands dirty, even as you're writing, and say, here's what I'm going to do this week. Like what are question number three? What are some areas of personal influence where you can work this week to diligently share the good news of salvation with those who are lost, recognizing that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few? Yeah, I'd like you to say, hey, here's a, here's an action plan of how I'm going to uh, ex- exercise my personal influence in an evangelistic way this week. I mean, that's it's like, okay, answer that question. But if you answer it well, 
you're going to set yourself up for great ministry this week because you've set through, prayed, and taken time, even with your life group, to say, here's what I'm going to do this week. Now, uh, there, there was that one. Uh, I love question number four. You, you read 2 Corinthians 11 and Philippians 2, and you ask this question, when you consider how far the apostle Paul was willing to go to see lost people saved, and then how much Jesus suffered for the salvation of lost souls, how does that motivate you towards a more sacrificial view of your evangelistic labors? And then how can you sacrifice this week for the advancement of the gospel? I, Paul just, just, man, he just... He wrecks me, you know, that, that <laughs> kind of Bible thing. Uh, and even in Second Corinthians 11, it's like he's been shipwrecked multiple times, right? I mean, Paul's been wrecked for the gospel. Like, I mean, it's like that text is so good to me because it shows how much stuff Paul went through. And it's like, and he's writing as like, and I'm still doing it. It's not like, oh, I learned my lesson and I don't do that anymore. It's like, I'm in prison, you know, he's not in prison, I guess, in the letters to the Corinthians, but like he's been in and out of prison and he's going to go to prison again. And it's like, man, this man was just willing to give it up all for the gospel. And then obviously Jesus, as he suffered for the salvation of lost people, it's like that should motivate you to say, I need to be more sacrificial in the way that I look at evangelism and my labors toward it. Wonderful. All right. Well, Compass, we have several announcements uh, upcoming for, well, one for the spring and actually some for the summer. Uh, Don't forget, Compass, we have our prayer night coming on April the 30th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Oh, yeah. Come on. We have have our worship. uh, we have well, a worship, worship and a family prayer room, so you can bring family the kiddos prayer room. to model what prayer looks oh, like with your on. kids. And then everyone else will meet in the auditorium. And it'd be great. We have a lot of answered prayers to update on, we and sure also do. we need more prayers. Let's go. Um, Pastor Ian, what's happening this summer? Yeah, we have summer kids camps. Woo-hoo! Well, and that's amazing. Registration for VBS Art and Science Camp are now open. We already have uh, lots people. of kiddos who are registered. We are already way ahead of last year. We are, but there's deadlines. There are deadlines. VBS, you got to sign up before June 4th. Art camp, you got to sign up before July second, and then science camp, you got to sign up before July thirtieth. So, so no are, walk ups, no walk ups. There are deadlines. Make sure you know that. Let your uh, friends and family know. But we would love you there. We don't want to try to keep you out. We just want to make sure you get in. You know, a lot like salvation. And right? Noah's Ark, uh, good Friday. Noah's Ark. There yeah. it is. Uh, we also have our student revival D now. Uh, we want you to save the date. The registration is coming soon, but we want you to get it on the calendar so you know when your kiddos are going to be at camp. Uh, it's a sta- it's a stay it's a stay at home camp though. It's like a staycation. It's, it's a staycation for your your students. It's a camp. So you save the date for Thursday, July twenty seventh through Sunday, July thirtieth, and they that will be their summer D now registration is coming soon. But make sure you put it on your calendars so you don't miss out. All right, church, we're grateful for you. Wow, God has been just so gracious to us over the last three, four weeks at our church. He's growing the church. People are getting baptized. People are getting saved. People are getting plugged into community and discipled, and we're here for it, and we hope you are too. And on that note, we look forward to seeing what God's going to do in your life and in this church over the weeks to come. We'll see you next week.